I'm standing in Palermo in front of Teatro Massimo, which is the largest opera house, are you ready for this? Not just in Sicily, in all of Italy. It is amazing and gorgeous, as you can see. It was founded by the Florio family, which was an amazing Sicilian Palermo family, Palermo Tani, and they were manufacturing and spices and wine, and they practically invented Marsala wine and also figured out how to preserve tuna in olive oil. So if you like tuna fish in olive oil, you have the Florios to thank for it. But besides all the cool things like that that Sicily have contributed, there's really significant arts contribution, not just in opera or paintings by someone like Gattuso, but for, for my field, books. I mean, Sicilian literature is so wonderful and people like Giovanni Verga really captured what peasant life was like. And of course the great leopard that's just the seminal novel here. And I tried to get those elements in my book and try to write what a typically Sicilian story in a typically Sicilian fashion. But this is really an amazing place that I wanted you to see. That opera house is so amazing and I wanted you to see it. And I, if it looks familiar to you and you're a godfather freak, like somebody you know, uh, that is actually the opera house that is in Godfather 3 at the very end. If you haven't seen it, I won't ruin it for you. But something really dramatic takes place on those very steps. It was filmed there and it's operatic in dimension and it couldn't be more timely or more perfect and i wanted you to see that upper house because it's so cool and i also wanted to take a minute to talk about the creative process and what happens when you write historical fiction because what i started to do and i started to mention it in that is that you're gonna you're trying to understand what sicily is like so you have to understand what's unique about sicily and to do that you have to read the literature of sicily so giovanni verga and other people i mentioned all of these things i just read them all and a lot of this period fiction, because also you're trying to read the references of the time, and you're also trying to understand the language of the time. For example, when you write loyalty, you write it in 2023, I think that's the year, but you, you can't write it, you can't say, you're right, you can't use slang, you can't use contractions, you have to write in the period of the time. And so you read the literature of the time. And I wanted to talk about the opera and the literature, but it's really important. It's really important to understand that Sicily had a widespread illiteracy rate. People, they were behind the rest of Europe by far. So the fact is, and as we've talked about before, it was really a class system. So that opera wasn't accessible to everybody. Books weren't accessible to everybody. So then I started to say, well, you have characters in this, in loyalty who are noble, barons, but you also have characters who are peasants. What is the art form of peasants? It's the folklore, it's the story. And it just so happens, and it's not an accident, that there was a very, very famous Sicilian folklorist. His name was Giuseppe Pitre. Now I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, but does it matter? No. Here is a picture of him. And he is actually, bear with me, this is actually him. And he was from this time period. And he was a really brilliant guy, kind of a nobleman himself. But he understood so much about Sicilian history and he wanted to record it. And so what he did in around 1875 is go from, he was like the Brothers Grimm, right? They're just only in Sicily and unique to Sicily, not interested in Italy. He wrote the collected Sicilian folk and fairy tales. And he said, I want to codify this. This needs to be written down because these are the stories of the people. Yes, in a way, opera is the story of the people, but people, the regular person wasn't seeing that. It might be about the regular people, Cavallero Rusticana, a million Italian operas have peasants in them. But 
The stories of the people are the stories the people tell that mean something to them. And if you read them all, as I have in these two volumes, the second one is here, you can get a really clear picture of what it was like to be not only in reality a Sicilian peasant, but also what they talked about, what it was in their imagination. These are, they are kind of fairy tales. They're stories about barons and kings and princes. I have, I sort of suggest that in loyalty. I don't want to give that away right now. But you see the kind of things that populated their imagination. And what Giovanni, what Giuseppe Petri did was go from town to town and he actually spoke to people and he wrote down who told him the story. So here's, for example, a story. Let's see what the title is. Doesn't really matter because it says it after every one. Katarina the Wise, very famous story, very famous Sicilian story with a typical trope. Who will a young noblewoman choose to be her suitor? You've seen that before. That's in Shakespeare. That's in Merchant of Venice. There's always a, every single fairy tale has, who will she choose? Who will she choose? So what, what Petrie does is go around and collect all the stories. He will tell you, told by Agatuzza Messia in Palermo. He actually divided it collected all of the folk tales, wrote them all down and did it by region. So that that's a that's a treasure trove for someone like me, because I'm like, wait a minute, loyalty is going to be set in Sicily, in Palermo, in this time period. I have to read all of the folk tales in that time period and to understand something about what it was like to live there. And it was so amazing and so charming because you see things like some are some of the folk tales have proverbs. One proverb is never, never marry, never live in a house with a trellis. Who knows where that's from? You know, these strange folk wisdom, I mean, you know, if you have any kind of tradition of ethnicity in your family at all, uh, you know, there has to be red somewhere or you throw salt over your shoulder or whatever those things are. We have a million of them Italian Americans do. And those are all codified in here as as what were the stories in Sicily. And at the end of most of them, it's so charming. There's something called, it's like a little coda, because at the end of the story, which is very self-consciously a story, they don't want you to forget yourself. It's actually somebody telling you a story. And at the end, they'll say, and so they lived on in contentment and peace while we sit here grinding our teeth. At the end, it's a story about noble people, but at the end, it's always about the real people the peasants. Here's another one. Story there, coda at the end. They remained happy and content while we still don't have a scent. Isn't that amazing? It's so characteristic of Sicilian folk tales and folkloric history to do that. I said, I want to have that in this book because it's true. First, it's going to inform a character. The character is Alfredo. He's a goat herd. He's a poor man. Now, the other Sicilian fun fact I wanted to point out to you is I'm always trying to get what's unique to Sicily. And one of the things I learned is about a certain type of goat. It is called the Girgantana goat. And it is from Agrigento in Sicily, where Laura and I went on the trip. We tried to find one. We couldn't find one because it's a very specialty goat. We found some other goats I'll show you in a minute. But this is a picture of the Girgantana goat. Do you see the most remarkable thing about these? They're very beautiful white goats. They say they have very refined faces and mouths, and they do. They're really, really pretty. But look at their horns. Their horns, it looks like a fairy tale animal. This is a magical animal. If this kind of animal grows in Sicily, and I can't get this into a book, I should be fired. Look how they curly queue up. Isn't that amazing? I'll show you some other pictures. Here's one at a distance you can see. It's so amazing. So in loyalty, there's a character named Alfredo, and he has Girgantano goats because he is from Agrigento, and he makes cheese from their milk, and because their milk is so rich in fat, it makes the most amazing cheese. And that ends up being really good news for Alfredo and really bad news for Alfredo. So when you read loyalty, think of that, you'll see. And I want, we did go looking for, for goats and sheep and, so, and I wanted to really get life on a farm. And I thought I would show you some of these pictures because here, for example, are sh sheep and lambs just born. I don't know if you can see, this is their, 
they, they keep the moms and the babies together. And when you go in there, I like animal smells. It smells so wonderful. It smells all milky and sweet. There's a little sweetness to the milk. We saw baby lambs just born. I'll show you some more of these. And then I'll show you the super hot Italian goat herd that we met. I saw this baby just born. This little baby lamb. This is why I don't eat lamb. Baby lamb. Look at, and there's her sheep mommy. And we came over and the mommy was very nice, but I was like, I'm not going to bother you. I'm not going to take your baby or hurt your baby. Look at this. All together. And this be, is still a way of life and a living for so many people. Here is the super hot Italian Sicilian shepherd, cheese maker. And uh, I'll show you a picture. Also, this is right outside the town of Musimelli, which is also in the book where Al Alfredo lives. And here is also the mayor of the, t the somebody on the town council of Musimelli, a woman who was terrific. So that's what I kind of wanted you to see. And that's why it matters. When you read loyalty, I, I hope that even though it reads easily and fast, like a modern book would, it transports you back to a time and a culture where there's lofty people and you can never be them and you can never own anything, but you find happiness in your family. You find a way to make a living and you tell yourself the stories that, and you keep story alive, just like we keep story. I mean, I don't really see the difference between a story told and reading a book or listening to an audiobook. I, as I've mentioned, I love audiobooks so much. And part of the reason I do is because I feel like if you say to me, what is my job besides being a mom? I think it's being a storyteller. And the first stories we all heard were told to us or read to us. We hear them in the oral tradition. So it makes so much sense to me that story, tell me a story. Every time I pick up a, a book up, I'm saying to the author, tell me a story. So I really wanted to get that kind of earthiness, but also love of story, moral character, and just how to live your life and how to love your family in loyalty. So that's the background of it. It has to do with the Girgantana goats and now you know. Um, I will mention too that, as you know, we do send these books out to booksellers and I was so, so happy to send it to Reads and Company, which is my local independent bookseller in Phoenixville, Pennsylvania. And Jason Haffer, the very owner of the store, really loved the book. And he said, loyalty is truly epic, loaded with unforgettable characters, vivid history, and a plot that just won't quit. It's unforgettable. I was so happy when I saw that. So please support your local bookstore because we need books in our neighborhoods. But the most important thing is if you've never been here before, you may not know why we're doing this. And the reason we do this is to say thank you. It is just about thank you. I'm really grateful for your support. I have been writing books for 35 years now. And you guys have followed me from book to book. I can write whatever I want. I just try to make it the best I can possibly make it and try to put everything into it. All my heart, all of this stuff, all the things I learn, you know, and a little bit of Girgantana cheese, you know, like all that kind of stuff. But it doesn't happen without you guys. And I know that. And I'm very aware of it. And I'm very, very grateful for each and every one of you for your support of my books, for your kindness to me and my family, to Francesca, to Laura, to our dogs, to all of us. I love seeing you these nights. I'll see you next week. I'll be back home. And um, I'll look a lot younger. It'll be like a miracle. So stay tuned. But thank you very, very much for coming. And I'll see you next week. Thanks again. Bye-bye.